How'd y'all know that was my favorite song of all time? I love that song, Revelation song. We're going to ask, if you will, turn your copy of God's Word to uh, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians uh, chapter 12 is where we're going to be. We're going to be reading verses 12 through 31. Uh, it's an interesting thing uh, that this morning, I, you know, God had laid this message on my heart, but I was beginning to wonder through the week, was this the message that God really wanted me to bring? Or was He wanting me to speak on something else? And so I really wrestled with this, going back and forth about not knowing whether this was the message or not. Well, God confirmed it, because uh, I, I, I filled in for Rolene this, this morning in the telephone uh, class, and, uh, and it just so happens to be that the lesson this morning was on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. So it went in perfectly with what we're talking about today, and so uh, we're very thankful with what God is doing and continues to do. I do have a few uh, announcements I'd like to uh, mention before we begin. First of all, just as a reminder, uh, Karen Slate from, from the Baptist, Baptist Children's, Children's Home uh, will be with us coming up next week, and she'll be speaking on the ministry at the Baptist Children's Home. Also, uh, we collected uh, 22 thus far, we know of 22 backpacks uh, for the uh, for the ministry, backpack ministry, and I believe if I was told this morning that we are in the top three of collectors, so thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Merritt contacted me this morning by text and, and said, said that, that thus far we have collected from across the entire association something like 1,538, so 1,538 backpacks. And the, and the goal was a 1,000, so we have well exceeded that as an association. So we want to thank you so much, everyone who's participated in this as well. Be much in prayer for me also this week. i uh, got to go back up to Lynchburg for an intensive. Um, it's always, always bittersweet, bittersweet doing, doing that. that. Uh, I always miss my family, miss you guys, uh, but I get a chance to meet some wonderful people up there as well. So it's kind of a bittersweet thing. But thankfully, there's only six more left after this. So you pray for me. If I can survive next year, I think I'll have the classwork behind me. And as I've told Jennifer, this is the last one. Uh, she's promised, held me to that, and so I don't think the gray matter can handle anything else after this and so we're done with. So next, next year we'll be done, done with, with the classwork, classwork and thank the Lord for that. All right. Today, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31, uh, we're talking about the cooperation of evangelism. And you know, a lot of times it seems like we as believers, we as Christians, we get jealous over one another. If something good happens to somebody else, we'll say, well, why didn't that happen to me? It's nice for them, but it should be me that's getting the honor. Uh, or some, some, sometimes something will happen to someone. Uh, maybe someone comes down with uh, diabetes and will say, well, if you hadn't eaten so many chocolate cupcakes, then maybe you wouldn't have got it. So we have a problem a lot of times. We're quick to judge, and we become jealous of one another. But understand, that is not the vision that God has for the church at all. In fact, as we're going to see in this passage of Scripture, evangelism is not just an individual thing. It is a cooperative thing. We as a church must come together and unite. As Jesus says, a divided house cannot stand. Now, if you have somebody who tells you that, who says, I'm going to get crucified, and they're crucified, and if you have someone who tells you that, that I'm not only going to get crucified, and I'm going to raise from the dead, and they actually do it, doesn't it behoove us to actually listen to what that person says? Because it tells me that he might be telling us the truth. So we as a people of God must come together. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31, we're going to ask everyone, if you will, please stand and honor the reading and hearing of God's precious holy word. Now in verses 1 through 11, as we talked about this morning in Sunday school, he talks about spiritual gifts. He talks about uh, that uh, in our former lives we were led away by false traditions and, and, and things of this nature. But he says that no one can come to the Spirit of God. No one can say Jesus is Lord unless it be by the Holy Spirit. And we know that faith itself is a gift of God. Did you realize that? Even coming to Christ is in itself a gift of God. We could not say Jesus is Lord unless it were by the working of the Holy Spirit manifested in our lives. And so he mentions this. He says there are many different ministries and he talks about different gifts of, of, of uh, miracles and healings and, and things of this nature. Uh, he talks about these different workings, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But notice in verse 11, he says, There's one in the same Spirit, works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Well, now he's going to pick up on this concept as he continues through the chapter. 
And there's a number that's going to stand out some, if I counted right, five times in the first two verses. Six times if you count verse 14 and probably more. So, see if you can catch the number. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that... All right, help me out. What, what number? number? One body, being many, are body, so also is Christ. For by Spirit we were all baptized into body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into Spirit. For in fact the body is not member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, were one, uh, where one would be the hearing, if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Now can you imagine if all the body were a big nose? Can you imagine, imagine if, if your, your body, body was, was nothing, nothing but a nose? nose? Well, you might be able to smell some of the good things. Well, you might smell some of the bad things, too. But you wouldn't be able to go anywhere. You wouldn't be able to see anything. You wouldn't be able to really do anything except for smelling good things and not so good things. Um, verse 18, But now God has set the members, each of them, in the body just as He pleased. And if they were all member, member where, where would the body, body be? But now, indeed, there are many members yet body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on this we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it but there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have the gifts of healing, do all ha speak with tongues, do, do all, all interpret, interpret but, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And so he's going to talk about these different gifts, and he's going to say there is one gift that should be strived for more than any other gift. And he talks about that one gift in chapter 13. And guess what that is? Love. That is the most excellent gift. Because he says, Now there abides these faith, hope, and love. And, and the, the greatest, greatest of these is love. To kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you but that we are part of a family, of one family, created by one God, established by one Savior, and empowered by one Holy Spirit. Lord, we just simply ask, Lord, this morning that you would empower us and give us strength, Lord, to give us insight to know the words of truth that you've set before us. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you fill me with your Spirit, allow me to speak the words that need to be spoken and hold back any words that don't. But in and through it all, Lord, we invite you to give us eyes so we can see, ears so that we can hear, and hearts that will apply these truths and, and, and truly serve you, Lord, the way that you've called us to. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. It's, it's good, good for us to have heroes in the faith, and there's nothing wrong with that. But a lot of times it seems that, that we, we follow after people more than we follow after God. Is that not the case? A lot of times we follow after people more than we follow after God. But it's interesting that that can lead us down to some bad paths. For instance, I heard a story. I, I can't remember if I've shared this with you or not. But it's a very interesting story of this uh, Christian, good godly Christian immigrant who came to the United States and who came to a North Carolina church. He couldn't speak much English, but he could, he could recognize a few certain words. 
And so he found this really nice gentleman, this tall gentleman, by whom he sat beside. And so he imitated everything this tall man did. When the tall man stood, this immigrant man would stand. When the tall man sat, the immigrant man would be seated. When the tall man sung out, the immigrant tried his best to follow along. So the immigrant did everything the tall man did. Well, there came one part in the service where the congregation was quiet, and the preacher said a few words. And then he said something, and the tall man rose. No one else stood, but the tall man did. And following suit, the immigrant man stood up. Well, the tall man became angry and pushed the man down. And this deeply hurt the immigrant's feelings because he thought that he was doing everything he was supposed to do in the service, and he didn't want to be an outcast by any means. Well, after the service, the immigrant man started walking out of the church with his lower lip hanging out, being hurt by what happened. And the tall man came up to him and said, Sir, listen, I've got to explain something to you. I didn't mean to be ugly to you. But you see, this part of our service was a baby dedication. And the pastor asked if the father of the child would please stand up. I was the only one who was supposed to stand up. And that's why I pushed you back down. You see, when we follow people, it can lead to bad results. Amen. Sometimes we can be like the blind leading the blind. But if we follow God, if we follow God's vision, if we follow what God has called us to be, then we will fulfill the mission. We will fulfill the ministry that God has established for us. The Church of Corinth is a lot like the modern American church. They had been. Uh, they were living in a time where there were several different worldviews. Uh, this was a. This was a fairly wealthy town. They had a lot of resources available to them. There were a lot of temptations that uh, led them away from the ministry that they were supposed to have. And the Church of Corinth had become a divided church because they began to compete with one another. And some of them were even divided. divided. Some, some says, "Well, I follow Peter." And others say, well, I follow Paul. And the super spiritual say, well, I follow Jesus. And and forget about the rest of you folks. You guys don't matter. Paul says, listen, it's kind of like, you remember the Andy Griffith show? You remember when they had the guest preacher and he comes and preaches? And one person says, well, I, and Andy says, well, I side with Preacher Tucker. And I don't need to listen to this guy from New York City. I side with Preacher Tucker. And Aunt B says, Andy, they're they're on the the same same side. side. And so true is that. How true is that? That we're all part of one body. We're all part of one one body of Christ. Whether we be Jew, whether we be Greek, no matter where we come from, we are part of one body. And what Paul is telling the church of Corinth is to be the people God has called you to be, we must be one body, collectively going about doing the things that God God has has called us to do. So he talks about the cooperative nature of evangelism. And so he tells us three things and how working cooperatively is much better than working individually. First and foremost, he mentions that evangelistic cooperation is based on the understanding of unity. In verses 12 through 13, did you count? I counted at least five times that he mentioned the number one. Six if you count verse 14. But notice he says that the body of the church is one body but has many members. That means that the church is bigger than you. Amen? That means the church is bigger than our understanding of the church. That means the church, Westfield, I love you, but the church is even bigger than Westfield Baptist Church. Can I stretch your mind a little bit more? The The church church is bigger than the the Surrey Baptist Baptist Association. The church is bigger than the state convention of North Carolina. The church is bigger than the Southern Baptist Convention. How many of you know that there are going to be people from different denominations in heaven? Amen? There are going to be people who aren't Southern Baptists who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who will be there. And I'm sorry to say... They're not going to be different floors to heaven. You've heard of that story where a guy goes to heaven and he goes up an elevator and the angel tells him, well, on this wing, this wing is a certain section and he's describing each section as they go up and he goes to one section and it's raucous. I mean, there's a lot of loud noises. He says, this is the Pentecostal wing to heaven. And they go up another level and it's real quiet in there. He said, this is the Methodist wing to heaven. They go up another level and they're taking communion and he says this is the Lutheran section to heaven. And then he goes up another floor and says shh, be very quiet. And so they go up to the next level and he asks them well who was on that previous level? He says that was the Baptists. They think they're the only ones here. we got to be quiet when we go up. 
Well, amen. Obviously, we know that's not true because, because the body of Christ is more than one church, more than one denomination. It is a global entity which has members who are of the past, who are of the present, and who are of the future. And the Bible tells us that we're all part of one family because if we understand what Jesus tells us and that a person really doesn't die, then those people that we've lost are still members of the church. Did you catch that? That's, That's what, what the, the ancients, ancients called the communion of saints. That we have brothers and sisters who are here in this church, but we have brothers and sisters who have passed from the body but are in the heaven with the Lord who are still part of the church. You see, there's no time limit on the church. If you're in Christ, once you're a member, it's kind of like that gang sign, you're for life. And even beyond that, Amen. <laughs> You're for life, and even beyond that, you are a member for, for all eternity. eternity. But, but we, we are, are part of one body, which is the Christ, which is a, of God, one God, one Savior, one Spirit, which is of one church. So, what does it mean to be part of this church? Now, you know me; I've, you know thoroughly thus far that I am a Green Bay Packers fan. If you were to cut me open, my blood would probably bleed green and yellow. I, I admit, but I have to give credit where credit is due. due. Even, Even though, though I'm not a fan, fan my brother-in-law is a big fan of this team, I've got to give credit to the New England Patriots. Any Patriots fans here? All right. You've got to give credit to them, and you've got to give credit whether you like them or not to Bill Belichick. Now, Bill Belichick is a real solemn man. I think I've only seen him smile two times in his whole football career. He gets up there. He's very matter-of-fact. But, but you, you got to give him credit. credit. His, His dad, dad was, a, was an admiral in the United States Navy, and I think those skills were passed on to him. And so they asked him one time, because he doesn't go after the flashiest players. He doesn't really go after the big-name people. But every single year, his team is successful. It is absolutely mind-boggling when you really stop and think about it. He doesn't go after the big names, but every single year, they are successful. And someone asked, asked him, what does it take to be a Bill Belichick guy? And he says, when I look at players, I'm looking for three things. One, I'm looking for toughness. Is that person not only physically tough, but are they mentally tough? Can they take a hit and keep on keeping on? You know, I, I, this past week I watched the movie Rocky Balboa. And I have to say this is probably one of my favorite Rocky movies. Because Rocky is on up in years. And he's challenged to fight the heavyweight champion of the world in a boxing competition. He doesn't get the credentials from the boxing association, but he does it anyhow. Because he says, i got to get this boxing beast out of me for once and for all. And Paulie says, let this be it. So he goes in the ring, and the heavyweight champion is knocking him silly. He doesn't win the fight. I hate that as a spoiler in case you haven't seen. But everybody applauds him because he hung in there every single round. And one time he takes a big hit that knocks him down and he's on his knee and he's about to be knocked out but then he remembers something that he told his son. Words that I think that we should live by as well. It's not how hard you can hit that matters. It's how hard you can get hit and keep standing back up. And those words inspired him to stand back to his feet and stay in the fight. Even though he didn't win the fight, he stayed in there. Bill Belichick says that's what he's looking for. And I believe in the church, that's what God develops us to be. Not that we hit the hardest, but the devil throws everything he can at us. And we keep on standing up because of the Spirit abiding in our lives. Now who knows? We could get a, who knew that we could get a spiritual application from Bill Belichick? But it's there. Secondly, he says he's looking for intelligence. He's not looking for the flashiest players, but he's looking for people who will stay the task, who will learn the, the, the plays and will stay at it, and he's looking for dependability, people who will show up every single game. And, beloved, I believe that's what God is developing, developing us as a people of God to be, to be tough. Because if, if you take, take a stand, stand for Christ, Christ not everybody's going to like you. And in fact, in this culture, if you take a stand for Christ, you may have people who are adamantly against you. He's looking for people of intelligence, not that we must have a high IQ, but be willing to learn from Him and forever be His disciples, His students, and that we de are dependable, that we keep showing up no matter what happens. Who knew that we could get spiritual application from Bill Belichick? 
but I believe we can. I think the same is also true for, if you watch the World Series, the Washington Nationals won their first ever World Series. And I was uh, impressed by the, one of the MVPs of the game, Max Shermer, I believe is his name. Uh, he said at the end of the game, he says, what makes this team a success is that from 1 to 23, we're all on the same page. We, we all love, love one another, and we are united together, and that's what saw them through some very tough issues going forward in the World Series. Beloved, that is what we as a church must be. Not focused on man-made denominations, not focused on situations as that, but be focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ because unity is a biblical concept that must be emphasized. And when it comes to evangelism, we are all on the same team. We're all working together for the same thing, which is the glory of God. But secondly, we see this evangelistic cooperation is based on diversity. In verses 14 through 24, we see this. And he basically says that while we are united in the essentials, we are different people. We're individuals that God has created with a different skill set, with, 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 different, with different abilities and different opportunities and different situations. And the reality is, is that He calls us to use us in particular situations. And beloved, He can reach out and save anybody. Now, I don't know whether it's a publicity stunt or whether it's genuine, but they say that Kanye West has received Christ as a Savior. And to be honest, I don't know his situation, and I hope it's legitimate, but, but I, I tell, tell you this, if it is legitimate, legitimate He can do great things for Christ. Due to his platform and due to where he is and where he's been, he can publicly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ to people that we can't reach here in Westfield, North Carolina. So it's not us versus them. We're all part of the same body of Christ. And so we all have different skill sets. And just as you have an individual fingerprint, you also have individual gifts that God has bestowed upon you that, guess what, no one else has. And a lot of times what I believe we try to do, unfortunately, is we try to say, we try to put the pastors on the pedestal. We try to put pastors on the pedestal and say, their gifts are better than others. But how many of you know that's not true? It doesn't matter whether you're seen by a bunch of people or, or if, if you're, you're working, working in the, the backgrounds. Background, if you use your abilities to the glory of God, God will bless you greatly. Because believe you me, there are a lot of things that this old boy can't do. And I praise an organization as we're going to see as one of them. And if we have anybody with the gift of organization, you need to come to my office and help me out because my office is not organized at all in the least bit. But anyhow, we all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. And I understand that the things you've been through in life will actually help minister to people that other people can't. So use your gifts for the glory of God and uh, don't let past mistakes uh, be the definition or, uh, uh, or be the definition of who you are. Evangelistically, your past may be what God uses in the present to transform someone's life in the future. Now, I, I truly believe, believe that life is like a spider web. And at each, each juncture of our lives, we meet people that other people won't meet. We have an impact on people that we never fully realize until we get into eternity. It may just be that doing the simple things in life may be something that leads another to the Lord. So stay, stay faithful in what God has called you to do. Keep on keeping, keeping on and keep, keep get, getting, getting back up and trusting in Him. And don't let the devil bring you down. Last but certainly not least, I, I tossed this around about what to call this. And so uh, <laughs> we'll just go with this. Evangelistic cooperation is based on Subsidy. I, I really didn't know what to call this. The word that ended with a Y so we can keep the consistency going on here. But what, what is, is a subsidy? A subsidy is a benefit given by the government to an individual, business, or institution. In the case of the church, what we find is that the Spirit of God has given certain gifts to each individual within the institution of the church. The person does not obtain the gift. You don't work for the gift. You don't earn the gift. The gift is given to you by the Spirit of God. Did you catch that? The gift is given to you by the Spirit of God. There is a purpose behind the gift that God has given you. 
And unfortunately, a lot of times we look at these gifts and we try to categorize them saying this one's better than that one. But in the end, all of them are beneficial. All of them are useful for God's glory. It's like the Billy Graham Crusades. I went to the Billy Graham Library and they talked about these crusades. And of course we see Billy Graham up there. But did you know it took thousands and thousands of people working behind the scenes to pull off just one of those crusades? Thousands of people. If it weren't for those thousands of people, you would have never known Billy Graham because there would never have been a crusade one. It took everyone working together. Yes, Billy Graham was out front. But how many of you know today that the people working in the background were just as much part of that ministry as Billy Graham was being in the foreground? Use your gifts, whatever they may be, for the glory of God. Now, what are some of the gifts that he mentions? Well, this isn't the only passage of Scripture that mentions spiritual gifts. But the one he's laid out here are as follows. First of all, God gives some to be apostles. The ancient version of, uh, or the modern version of an apostle is a missionary. You ever notice that some people have an easy way striking up conversation with people they don't know? Now, I can in certain situations, but in other cases, it may be a little more difficult. But some people are given the gift of being a missionary. Uh, and missions do, do start at home. We've got to first start at home and in our local assembly, our local area. The modern equivalent, again, is a missionary. So God has given some to be apostles, which are missionaries. Secondly, God has given some to be prophets. Prophets are preachers who expose sin, who proclaim the gospel of Christ. Uh, th these could be called preachers. Thirdly, God gives some to be teachers. Teachers are individuals who instruct and build up the church with the knowledge and insights from the Word of God. And believe you me, we need teachers teaching the Word of God in today's society because biblical illiteracy is at an all-time high. And I, I say this half-jokingly but half-serious. There are a lot of people today who don't know the difference between an apostle and an epistle. And that is, that is frightening to think about, but it is so very true. Number four, God grants some the ability to work miracles. That is, God is working supernaturally through that person's life. This trust that they have, this faith that they have in God to do something great. He is using their faith to accomplish great things. Fifthly, God gives some the gift of healing. Here I believe he's talking about those who are nurses, those who are doctors, those who are EMS, those in the fire department, those who are doing all these different things to help people in time of need, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Counselors could be added to here. Uh, six, there's, there's the gift of helps. These are individuals who are good with construction and good with their hands. Praise God for people who have the gift of helps. Because believe you me, you don't want me building a deck. Because if I were to build a deck, you certainly wouldn't want to stand on the thing after I finished it. That thing would probably collapse. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust, trust it myself. myself. So, But thankfully, God has given some people these gifts, the gift of helps. Seventh, God gives some the gifts of administration. These are individuals who can organize things, uh, who, who are good at administrative tasks. And praise God for those who are good at organization. Anyone good at organization here today? Come on, you can go ahead and lift your hands up. Oh, amen. Come on, any others? Praise God, God for you. Like I like said, if you run out of things to do, come see me at the office. I might need some help organizing some things. It's pretty bad. Eighth, God gives some the gift of tongues. Now, this can mean something spiritual like a supernatural language, but it can also mean something else. It can also mean people who are good with languages, who can interpret languages. And thankfully, there are people out there who translate the Bible in many different languages, who have this skill set and can reach people in different cultures where we may not be able to. You see, all of us have different strengths and weaknesses. Some are more extroverted in Scripture, like Samson. I think Samson was probably so outgoing that he was obnoxious. I don't know that you would really want to hang around Samson for any length of period of time because he'd probably get on your nerves pretty quickly. But Peter, God bless Peter. Peter was an extrovert. He stuck his foot in his mouth so many times his, his breath probably smelled like shoe leather or sandals. They had sandals back then. So it probably smelled like sandals at that time. But, but he did. And then Paul was a very outgoing person. But here's the thing. God also calls those who aren't extroverted, those who are introverted. He calls people like John the Apostle. John the Apostle wasn't out there up front the way Peter was, 
But boy, he sure did write some powerful documents that we have in the New Testament, didn't he? What would we be without the Gospel of John? What would we be without the three letters that he wrote and also the book of Revelation? Barnabas, did you know this? Paul would have never got his feet off the ground starting a missionary work if it were not for Barnabas, a more introverted guy, stepping in and taking up for Paul. Paul nearly was never a missionary if it had not been for Barnabas. Barnabas, for working behind the scene, made Paul who he was. Abraham was a timid man. Moses was not a man who wanted to stand up front, but God called him to do some powerful things. You see, it doesn't matter what, get, what uh, abilities you have. If you're faithful in, to Christ, He will take what gifts you have, He will take what abilities you have, and will make you into something great. The question is not how smart you are or how strong you are. It's the question is how willing are you to be used by God because God will take care of the rest. If you're willing, He'll take care of the rest. So use your gifts to the glory of God. Let me close with this. We have a very divided culture today, but we've been through things like this the church has before. In the 1600s, there was what was called a 30 years war between 1618 and 1648. This was a time when Europe was divided. People were killing one another over differences of belief and differences in interpretation and things of this nature. But yet there was a man, a German Lutheran theologian, by the name of Rupertus Meldinius. And how do you like that little neck thing he's got around there? Well, that, that wouldn't work, work for me. me. I, it's, it's, eating with that thing on, I'd have ketchup smeared all over it by the time I was done. I guarantee you. Don't eat, watch me eating a hot dog with that thing on. That'd be, that'd be bad news. But he said, he said he gave a statement during 1627 so powerful that the Moravian church has adopted it as one of their key quotes. He said this, In the essentials, we have unity. That means the, 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 what C.S. Lewis calls mere Christianity, what makes Christianity what it is, we're united together, even if we have differences of opinion, we are united together by one God, by one Christ, by one Spirit, part of one church. In the essentials, we have unity. In differences, we have liberty. How many of you know that it's okay if we disagree with one another over it's some time to time? time. Anyone ever agree with someone every time, all the time? Wives, have you ever agreed with your husbands 100% of the time? I didn't see you. <laughs> None whatsoever. The reality is, is we're going to have differences in opinion, but here's the thing. We have the liberty to disagree in the things that don't really matter. But he goes on to say, Meldinius says, but in all things we have charity, which means we must have love at the root of what we do. Paul says the same thing. You see, he goes through this, but he goes into chapter 13, saying this, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, if I don't have love, I am nothing. Did you catch that? No matter what gift we have, if it's not rooted and centered in the love of Christ then we can do nothing. Love is the most important gift that we've been given. And it must take center stage behind everything we do and say. Because there abides three things, Paul says, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. If we don't have love, nothing else matters. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me just tell you today that you don't have to have reverend in front of your name to be a minister. You don't have to have doctrine in front of your name to be a teacher. Maybe God is calling you to do something great today. What He's just simply asking for are individuals who are willing to say, Here I am, Lord. Use me. In Isaiah 6, Grace did a wonderful job telling us about that this morning. In fact, God may have changed my message for the last message in this series due to that. Isaiah 6, Here I am, Lord. Use me. What God is looking for are people who are willing to be used. Are you willing?